Okay, so hi everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm sure you all have uh, other places to be, but uh, uh, I still appreciate you choosing to be here with us. Uh, my name is Ami, like Mark said, um, that's pretty much what I do. And the links on the screen will tell you what I do. In recent years, I've been mostly focused on training and if you want to get in touch, you can visit my website. It's, uh, I apologize, it's pretty bad, but there is a contact form there. And uh, you can see my LinkedIn, and my LinkedIn uh, profile and my LinkedIn instructor page and my Pluralsight instructor page and my O'Reilly. O'Reilly doesn't actually have an instructor page. You're gonna have to look for me if you want. And I also posted, I'm gonna post it in a minute, uh, the demo database that I'm gonna be using for today's session uh, is available on GitHub. Uh, don't tell LinkedIn, but I'm using the same database that I developed that they paid me for, uh, but I hope you, you wouldn't mind. So uh, that's about that. Uh, this is the demo database that we're gonna use. It's called the Animal Shelter. And there's actually a whole project uh, database. Uh, if anybody is interested, I, you can see it's on my uh, main LinkedIn repository as well. But the version that I'm going to use today is a subset of the of the full project, and you can get links at, uh, with all the data. It's not a big database, but it's going to be fun, and it has uh, all the necessary tables that we need to uh, demonstrate what we're here for today. So let me just get you quickly introduced to the database. And while I'm at it, I cannot, I'll never um, give up an opportunity to discuss my database design choices. And you can immediately see the first thing that there is no surrogate, single surrogate key to be found here. So for example, if we look at the animals table, you can see the key is species and name. And this is the business key that I chose for the for animals. This is what I believe will be the most convenient business way of staff, uh, shelter staff to communicate between themselves when they want to reference an individual animal. So um, Donald the duck or um, Jerry the cat, right? This is some. This is the natural business key that you will use. You will not use. Okay, who is animal ID fifty seven? And uh, I don't want to get into that. If anybody, some of you have been to my session about keys, but uh, just be aware that this is going to be the database that we use. We have animals. We also have reference tables with the species and colors, which are the reference externally managed data. We have adoptions. We have persons staff, uh, vaccinations of the animals, staff assignment and staff roles. We're probably not going to use all of them, but um, at least some of them. And the topic of today's talk is about query logical processing. And it's kind of a fascinating topic because um, you're going to see it's, it's really a fundamental topic and it's one of the most fundamental aspects of SQL, which has huge, huge implications on everything that you do with SQL. But I still see very, very few books and very, very few courses that actually teach it. And uh, understanding the syntax without understanding the logical aspects behind it uh, sometimes can get you into pretty uh, a lot of trouble and spend a lot of time, uh, you know, scratching your head, trying to figure out why things work one way and they don't work the other way. So it's a huge topic. We can spend a whole day on it. Uh, but today um, we're just going to cover the fundamentals and hopefully um, this, uh, both the experienced among you and the beginners among you will come out with uh, some value from this. Uh, for the more experienced among you, I just ask that you be patient. I'm going to start from really the, the bottom and work my way up slowly, slowly. Be patient. It's going to be worthwhile. So let's start. What you see in front of you is SQL execution order. And as you can see, it is not the way you write the query. And this is going to accompany us for the rest of today's talk. 
and we're going to see exactly why this has such a radical impact on anything you do in SQL. So every query always, always begins with the from clause. And it doesn't matter if the from clause is just a single table or, as we'll see in a minute, even without a from clause, um, or if it has 300 levels of nested table functions, views, and remote text file calls, it all gets evaluated into a single data set, and that data set is then moved on to the next processing phase in turn. So if there is a where, it's gonna get moved to the where, and then down the line all the way until the last phase, which is the offset fetch. So this is what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to go one by one in order of execution and try to see how uh, this actually impacts the way that you write SQL and why some of these impose limitations on what you can and can't do, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, what else? So, yeah, a little bit of admin. Um, this, um, this talk is for everybody. If you've been to any of my talks, you know I like this to be interactive, so, um, but to a degree, right? So we don't want this to become a debate. And since we really don't have a lot of control, we left you the opportunity to unmute yourself. So if you want to ask a question, you can either use the chat. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Hopefully I'll see uh, when somebody asks a question. But if you must speak up, uh, then you're welcome to unmute yourself, ask a question, but please remember to mute yourself afterwards because otherwise it introduces a lot of joy and a lot of noise and feedback and that becomes, yeah, it becomes completely unbearable. So thank you for your cooperation in advance. Any questions so far? Makes sense. All is good. Give me an okay in the chat if we're good to begin. Okay, great. That's what I like. Yeah, be interactive. It's not like I can't see your faces. I'm not in front of you. So let's at least chat. Great. Okay, so from, uh, this is the first table that we're gonna use. Uh, the animals table, we can see we have the species and the name. Remember that is the key, the primary color, uh, the breed. Some of the animals are purebred. Some of the animals have no breed. We're gonna deal with nulls very shortly. I promise you that's gonna be interesting as well. Gender, birth date, color pattern, and admission date. Now, SQL, uh, SQL Server, even though SQL in general doesn't allow that, SQL does allow for a select statement without a from clause. So, for example, I can select a string literal. SQL is fun, even without a from clause. And what's going to happen under the covers, SQL Server is going to assume for me a source data set, which is a dummy data set that consists of a single row and a single column. Okay? And it's going to be processed as if I had a from clause from any source that is a single row and a single column. Some other databases like Oracle requ require you to actually spell it out. So Oracle has a table that's called dual. Um, SAP HANA has a table that's called dummy. Informix has a table that's called sysdual, but it doesn't really matter. The, what, what's important here is the processing order, which um, I'm going to hammer into your head today uh, relentlessly. The first thing that gets evaluated is the from clause. The data set that is evaluated in the from clause gets moved on to the select. The sele in this case, of course, if we have, uh, remember, we might have additional clauses. In this simple query, it simply skipped directly from the from all the way to the select simply because we don't have any of the others. And my first question to you um, is, What's gonna be the result of this query? If I execute this query, 
what's going to be the result. Use the chat. Guess away. Would you uh, would you get a row for every record that's in animals? Would okay. Let's try to follow query processing order. What's going to happen? How is the query going to be processed? First thing, the animal table will get evaluated as part of the from clause, regardless of what's in the select. Okay. In this case. There's no joins, no fancy, it's just a single table. All the rows with all of its columns, and this is important to remember, will get evaluated and moved on to the select. The select evaluates each expression for each row from the data set that it received. In this case, it's the entire animals table, and you're absolutely correct that what we're gonna get is the string literal SQL is fun, and this is going to be returned a hundred times simply because we have a hundred animals. So for some of you, it may seem weird, but if I put back the star, which gets translated underneath to all of the columns, you know what, let me put it uh, afterwards so it'll be easier to see, and execute it again, now you can see that all expressions, regardless if it's a string, it's a literal, or if it is, it is a reference to one of the underlying columns in the table, will get evaluated for each row that got into the, got into the, got to the select list. Okay, makes sense? Simple, right? Okay. Now, the same is going to be true when we move on, and you need to remember this because now it's really pretty simple and benign, but when we get to the little bit more complicated query, this simple fact is going to help you realize uh, a lot of what's going on under the covers. Okay, remember, animals table got evaluated, moved on to the select. The select evaluates each expression for each row of the animals table. And by the way, all rows, and this is another interesting aspect of SQL, all expressions get evaluated at once. There is no order. So I can write, for example, a species and name and name and I don't know, a breed. And even though I, I spelled, oops, even though I spelled them from uh, left to right, they all get evaluated at once. And why is that important? Because if, for example, I want to, I don't know, use an upper function on the name and give it an alias, let's call it upper name, and then I want to be a smart ass and do a lower of upper name, what's going to be the result of this query? Anybody care to guess? Well, it's spelled right. It will be an error. Why? Because upper name isn't defined yet. Well, it is defined here. I just defined it. Right, but they're all evaluated at the same time. Exactly. Because they're evaluated at the same time, that means that aliases that we, we put here, we cannot use in the same uh, clause, we can use them in the following clauses. And it so happens that the only clauses that follow the select, the distinct is not really a clause, the distinct is, um, is an operator on the set, we're going to get to that in a minute, uh, but only order by and offset fetch doesn't really uh, reference any particular column, so the only place we can put it in is order by. Um, this uh, interesting aspect of SQL also has additional implications. So for example, if I do something like, let's say uh, create table T and it's gonna have call one int and call two int and I'm gonna insert T 
values. One and two, and I'm gonna do a select star from T, right? Now, one of the implications of the all at once op operations is that in SQL, and that's one of the only languages uh, that we can do that, and that's because it's a declarative language, we can do something like update T, set call one equal call two, and call two equal call one, and because they get evaluated at the same time, we're not gonna lose any of the values. In any other programming languages, if you do something like that, you set the value of column one to column two, you just lost the value of column one. And when you set column two back to column one, you're gonna get both the same value, but not in SQL. In SQL, we're gonna execute that and we're gonna select again, and we can see that the columns have been swapped, okay? So that's another interesting aspect of the all at once. The all at once also applies to uh, also applies to rows, not only to columns and expressions. So something we can do something like the following. So uh, let's drop the table T for a second and make this guy a primary key and I'll insert the values one and two and two and three. And I'm going to run the following query, update T, set call one equals call one plus one. Okay? And equal will be nice. So let's execute this guy and here we are. Again, in any other language which doesn't have the all at once principle, what's gonna happen is first, this row is gonna get updated and you're gonna get a violation of the primary key. By the way, be very, very careful. I recently had um, a huge blunder during a course. I was demonstrating this and I was using PostgreSQL and it turns out that in Postgres, you have to define the primary key in a special way so that it will be respected. And what happened is I ran this query and I actually got a primary key violation. Uh, however, in SQL Server, that doesn't, that doesn't bother it. And you can see that both rows got evaluated at, got updated at the same time without any conflict. Okay, so that again is due to the all at once operator. So far, so good. Any questions about uh, all at once? Any question about um, from directly to select aliases? Yes, as there are question or yes, good so far. Okay, so let's move on. And now we're gonna deal with joins. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with joins and uh, I'm not gonna teach you the syntax of joins or anything. Let's say we need to do a join between animals and adoptions. I wanna see all the animals with all their attributes. By the way, an interesting aspect of using natural keys is that you see that the species here and here the species and name, because that's the key, that's also part of the key in adoptions. That means that any query that all that it's interested in is the, ident the real identifier of the animal, which is the species and name, doesn't require a join back to animals. So if I had something like an animal ID here, any query, no matter what, because when, you, when we look at adoptions, we don't care at the animal ID. We want to know if it's a dog, it's a cat, on what name. We want to actually identify the animal. That means that any query regarding adoption would always have to join back to animals. And here, when we use the natural key, we will only need to, use, to join if we're looking for any of the attributes which, is not part of, which are not part of the key, okay? 
Another interesting aspect is also, you can see that the adopter email, which is the way that we identify people in our shelter, also becomes part of the key. So now we have a composite key that consists of three columns, which might sound like a bad idea, but it's actually a great idea because now you get your indexes set up for you, typically for all the queries that you're gonna be looking for. But that's, again, that's, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, let's move on. So. Any join consists of three steps, and I'm gonna write them down so we have them in front of us. The first is a Cartesian product. The second phase is called qualification, and the third phase is called reservation. Okay, and it doesn't matter which type of join. The only difference between the different types of joins is how many of these steps they actually go through. So every join, no matter which one, if it's an inner join, an outer join, full, right, cross join, every join begins with a Cartesian product. Cartesian product is known in SQL as a cross join. And if I write animals cross join adoptions, What's going to happen is that every row in animals is going to be joined with every row from adoptions. And the result set is going to be the number of animals multiplied by the number of adoptions, which in our case is 7,000 rows. We have 100 animals and 70 adoptions. So we still have 30 animals that have not been adopted yet. Now, when I write, when I request a cross join, Processing stops at this point and simply doesn't continue to the qualification phase. And the result of the Cartesian product gets moved on to the select. And as before, every uh, row, every row gets evaluated for each expression, right? F, sorry, the other way around. Every expression is evaluated for each row. Also note that in this case, the star refers to all underlying table sources. So it's gonna return all columns from animals and all columns from adoptions, right? You're familiar with that, no big deal here. Next step, if our join is an inner join, then after the Cartesian product is evaluated, and I'm gonna leave it here because, you know what, but just to make it a little bit more clearer, Let's do, um, let's take animal, um, mm -hmm. no, I want to do it the other way around. So let's give it an alias. Let's call this AN and let's call this AD. And I'm going to show AD.species and AD.name and AD. A n dot breed. Let's say this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for adoptions and breed is not part of the key. So that's why I'm doing the join. I want to retrieve the breed for each animal. And now we get only three columns and that's going to be easier to look at. Okay. Okay. So remember cross join every animal matched with every adoption. If I change the cross join to an inner join. What I'm asking SQL to do for me is to add another processing step, which is called the qualification step. The qualification step evaluates each row from the Cartesian product that we just created using a predicate, which is called the qualification predicate. And the qualification predicate, as you know, we specify it using the on clause. And in our case, you can see a management studio was kind enough to um, complete it for me so I don't have to um, write the huge join of species equal species and name equal name, which is one of the downsides of using natural keys. So your joins are going to be spelled a little bit longer, but overall, it's not a big deal. So why did I... Why did I do that? I didn't want to do that. Let me write back. Let me write this again.
Okay. Now, just to make things a little clearer, let's add here a n dot species and a n dot name, so we can see the species and the name both from this, both from the adoptions and from the animals. And you can see that Archie the cat got matched with his adoption row, but Archie the cat also got matched with Buddy's um, row. So this is the adoption row of uh, Archie with the um, animal row of uh, Buddy. Now, typically, that's not what we're interested, although there are cases that cross joins are useful. For the most part, if we want to see animals and their adoptions, we want to see it based on some common denominator. Namely, we probably want to see the adoption and the breed of the animal that was adopted, not the breed, uh, not the adoption of Archie with um, Buddy's breed, right? And this is exactly the definition of the qualification. The qualification qualifies individual rows from the Cartesian product based on the predicate and only rows for which the qualification evaluates to true, will be returned, all the others will be discarded, and what we get back in return is now, let me just put this so, even though we don't really need it, uh, just so we can see. That indeed we get Archie's rows, uh, animal row next to his adoption row and Buddy's row next to his and Cleo's next to hers, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so on, right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Are we good so far? Make sense? Cool. Next. Now, one of the side effects of an inner join is that all animals that were never adopted, so here you can see we got 7,000 rows. We got all 100 animals multiplied by all 70 adoptions, meaning we got 7,000 rows back. So we can see all animals regardless if they were adopted or not. However, once we introduce the qualification predicate, that means that any animal which doesn't have a row in adoptions is going to get eliminated from the result. And as most of you probably know, this is exactly what outer joins are for. But what's important for me here is not to teach you, I'm sure you all know outer joins. What's important is again, processing order. So after the Cartesian product was evaluated and the qualification predicate was tested for each row of the Cartesian product, now the result set moves on to the reservation phase, but that only happens if we specify an outer join. But you know what? Before we do the outer join, I have another quiz for you. What will happen if I execute this query? Ignore the outer join for a second. We'll get back to it in a minute. What's going to happen if I execute this query? Anybody care to guess? Cartesian product. Right, exactly, right. As long as we follow execution order, no problem. Since we just said that every join begins with a Cartesian product and then the predicate is evaluated, the predicate that is always true will return all rows. And in our case, again, we get our 7,000 rows, which is the entire Cartesian product, meaning that this, um, innocent looking inner join is actually a cross join in disguise. Okay, great. Now moving on to outer joins. Outer join designates one or more of the sources as reserved. And the reserved 
set, or in this case, we're dealing just with tables, but this would be as true if we had a select query here or a call for a function. That's why I use the term set. The outer join designates either the, the set on the left or the set on the right as reserved. And what happens is that after the evaluation of the qualification, the reserve table gets a special privilege in which its rows, even those that didn't have a match, will come back, uh, will be reintroduced back into the set and will be um, passed on as part of the resulting set, in this case, to the select. So in this case, if I use a left outer join, and meaning that I want to return animals that didn't have adoptions. In this case, it wouldn't make sense to do a right outer join because if you remember, there's a foreign key, every adoption must have an animal. We cannot have an adoption without an animal. So a right outer join here is not gonna do anything, but a left outer join. And if here, let's just remember how many rows we got. We got 70 rows, that's the number of adoptions. If I use a left outer join, now we get 100 rows. And if we scroll down, oops, something funny happens here. And we can see that we get animals without a name. Anybody care to guess why? How come we get animals without a name? I know we have animals without a breed, but animals without a name. So the thing here, you can see the all rows that were reintroduced because of the outer join, since they don't have a match, and I kind of spoiled the fun a little bit. I should have removed this guy. That kind of gave it away. Lesson to note to self for the next time. This is what I wanted to show you. But anyway, um, as you know, because the animals that didn't have adoptions, they don't have anything to match. Therefore, we get a null back. And all we need to do in order to fix that is to remember to pick the key from the reserved table and not from the non-reserved table. And now we're gonna see all animals, regardless if they had an adoption or not. By the way, since I'm only selecting uh, properties, uh, attributes from the animal table, I, now I really can't tell which one was adopted and which one not. But typically, if we would want to see adoptions, we will also want to see something like adoption date. And now it makes perfect sense that all the animals that had a null for adoption date um, are the animals that were not adopted, right? Because adoption date is mandatory here. It doesn't show, but it is mandatory. Okay, make sense? Okay, now, before we move on to the next clause, uh, you know what, no, let's move on and go come back to the, come back to the animals later, to the left outer joint. The next step is the where clause. So all the result, no matter how many joins we had here, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're seven, time flies when you're having fun. Um, one quick word about joining more than two tables. And this is, uh, this is something that I think you're gonna find helpful. Let's say that we need to join the adoptions. We also wanna show the, pe the person who adopted the animal. Now, oops. Let's say we wanna show the person that adopted the animal. And let's go back to the inner join first and add another inner join persons as P on P email equals AD adopter email. And let me just put a star here so we can just see everything that's going on. Uh, 
Okay. And now we get 70 rows, which is our 70 adoptions. Every animal that was adopted with all of its animal attributes, all of its adoption attribute, but also all the attribute of the adopter himself, like the email, the first name, the birth date, address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? One of the things that I see most often is that people get confused because as long as we're only doing inner joins, no matter how many tables we're gonna join down the line, the order doesn't really matter because the result is always going to be only the rows that match each and every one on the way. But that is not the case with outer joins. So, What's going to happen if I take this inner join and add it here to our previous query? And now remember, just a second ago, the left outer join. Okay, animals. So remember, once we introduced the left outer join, that returned all the animals that were not adopted, and that resulted in all 100 rows. However, if I add another inner join to persons, what's going to happen? is that all the animals that were not adopted are gonna have a null for their adopter email, which means that now they're gonna get eliminated from the set and now we're back to our original 70 rows. So I'm sure you've all encountered it. The only thing that I do people see people do is instead of actually enforcing the join order, which is what we want here. Because what we want is for the adoptions to be joined to persons first and only then be joined back to animals using a left outer join and reserving the animals table. However, what I see most often is people just change all the joins to a left outer so that they can retain all the rows from the previous joins. And while this works and does give us the 100, the 100 rows, it can have devastating performance implications because you're not really leaving the optimizer a lot of breathing room. You're not telling him what you really want. You're telling him that you want a left outer join all the way from the beginning to the end. And there is a way around it. Um, there is a way around it. Anybody know how to force join order without resorting to um, changing? And I see sometimes queries with 30 tables all being left out or joined because of this. Uh, no, we don't need subqueries for that. Right, Nathan. We can actually put parentheses around the uh, the join that we want to be processed first. Hey, Connie, but, you have a yummy little fur burger. Mm. <laughs> Ay, this is fun. So, what's going to happen if I try just the um, naive approach and put parentheses around adoptions inner join persons and try to execute this query what's going to happen is i'm going to get uh, incorrect syntax and it's actually a bit misleading um, anybody care to anybody know how we can how we can fix this It's the last people who join Mark. It's the last two on the list. So if you scroll on the participant list, it's this Janet and James. Hey, At least we can hey, see. Don't kick me out, you freaking monkey. I'm a poopy. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Ew, uh, uh, ting. Can't you just kick both of them out and close the meeting so nobody can join? I don't know. Anyway, okay. so where were we? Yeah, just make sure I get the right one. So it's this Jenna. It, 
it's the Janet. Uh, the, it's always the last one. So the participant there, list. For me, they're in alphabetical order. Oh, really? For me, yeah. they're, uh, they're showing. Yeah, Janet Heinz. Okay, she's removed. Who else? Yes, um, that's it, I think. A James, did you say a James? Okay. No, no. I think that that guy left, so we're good. Yeah. Okay. yeah as so, long as you don't, as as long as you don't feed them too much, you know, they get bored and they just leave on. The <laughs> okay. So, um, what's happening here is that because the the expression or the join in the parentheses is evaluated first, the reference to species doesn't make sense in this context. And what we need to do in order for this to make sense is to remove it and move it outside the parentheses. So this becomes this funny looking join, which is animals left outer join adoptions seemingly without an on clause, inner join persons on, and let me just put the parentheses here so we can see them nicely. And this is a valid join, adoptions inner join person, where the reference is only to the expressions from the tables within the parentheses. So now we get on email equals, on AD, uh, AD species equal, and AD name equal AN. Now, the funny thing about this whole thing, which, by the way, is called chiastic order um, from the in, uh, where the ons are in reverse order to the order where, they, where the tables are uh, spelled out, is that we actually don't need the parentheses. What did the trick here is moving the on. And at this point, I can get rid of the parentheses altogether. And even though it's somewhat less readable this way, this is actually what did the trick. So the fact that the on of between adoptions and persons appear first forced adoptions to be joined to, person, to persons first, and then the on later, which joined uh, adoptions and animals, force the joint to animals and now if we execute this query you can see that we get our hundred rows back. So I don't necessarily recommend that you do it this way. I think it's actually clearer if you do keep the parentheses um, but remember it's just a visual aid. It doesn't really change anything. What is important is the moving of the on clause. Okay, makes sense. Yes, no, maybe. Any questions? Makes sense so far. Awesome. Yeah, we apologize for the inconvenience. It's, uh, I guess it's part, part of, we have to live with that as, as part of uh, being uh, virtual. Anyway, okay, let's move on. Next, we get to the WHERE clause, but now what I want to do is I want to stop sharing for a second and I want to switch. I'm just going to keep this query so we have, I'm going to take it with us because I want to show you some nice things that SQL Server actually doesn't have. And in order to do that, I'm going to be using PostgreSQL. Um, and I'm going to be using the Azure Data Studio. And you stop sharing on purpose, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you should be able to see the, my Azure Data Studio right now. And what I have here, I have a connection both to a SQL Server and to a PostgreSQL. Which so far work the same way. Okay, we'll get to the Postgres in a minute. 
So um, before we combine it all together with all the joins and the where and the predicates and why processing order is so important, let's first have some fun with the where clause just with a single table. And a few, a few interesting, uh, a few interesting uh, facts about nulls and about ternary logic in general. So when Dr. Codd first came up with his, uh, the first paper that introduced the relational model, which was called um, a mo data model for large share data banks, um, it had no notion of missing data whatsoever. And it was only market forces that later forced him to accept the fact, the reality, that in the real world, unlike in academic papers, we have to deal with missing data too. And while he was reluctant at first um, to, to do that, uh, eventually he was convinced. And when Dr. Codd did uh, incorporate the concept of null as an indicator for missing data, um, he actually uh, wanted to have two separate types of nulls. The first null was called, he called it I values, and the second type was called A values. The I values was missing and inapplicable, and the A values was missing but applicable. And both refer to missing data. So, for example, what do I mean? Um, if we look at breed of an animal, this, uh, what do you think this, uh, this would, what type of null that would be? Would that be missing an inapplicable or missing but applicable? I would think missing but applicable. Missing but applicable. Okay, anybody thinks otherwise? Okay, let me give you another example. So, um, does the animal, which is a mongrel, or let's say a mongrel is a dog, or a, 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 a feral cat, does he have a breed? Is a null indicator in the breed column represent something that we simply don't know, or something that doesn't exist? Think about it for a second. Breed could be either. No, breed could not be either. So breed is actually uh, the I values. It's missing and inapplicable. Why? Because a mongrel dog doesn't have a breed. It's not that it has a breed and we just don't know it which would be the missing but applicable. It's an applicable attribute, but we simply don't have that information. So for example, we can look at select, um, I don't remember if we have here from persons. So if we look at persons, we can see that we have persons which refused to provide their birth date. So we have a few persons with a null for a birth date. This is missing but applicable. It means that the person does have a birth date, but we just don't know it. The person for privacy concerns decided that he doesn't want to share it with us. Therefore, we have an indicator for a missing data, but the attribute is there. It exists. Alan Cook does have a birth date. We simply don't know it. That was not the case for the animals because a cat which is not purebred doesn't have a breed. It's not that it has it and we don't know it. It simply is inapplicable. For body, the breed attribute is inapplicable. Does that make sense? 
I see a few. Aha. Okay. Got you. Yeah, it does. Okay. Thanks. Great. So um, that was COD's original desire. So that SQL would have both types of nulls and they would actually have this different semantics and logic. And that would have required, instead of what we have today, which is three valued logic, where every predicate can evaluate to true, false, or unknown, it would have required four valued logic, which might sound crazy because even with three valued logic, Chris Date once said about nulls that they undermine, undermine the entire foundation of the relational model. He had, Chris Date was so fond of nulls, um, and by the way, so was Dr. Codd, but they simply realized that there was no choice. But the people who developed SQL, which were um, Chamberlain and Boyce, decided that this would make it too complicated, and instead, we have only one type of null that represents both missing and applicable and missing but applicable. And that actually, even though they tried to simplify things, as you'll see in a minute, it actually made things much more complicated than they should be. So you're all familiar with the basics of ternary logic. I'm not gonna go through that. So you know, we cannot ask where breed equals null because a comparison, a mathematical comparison between any attribute and a null or even any, um, it doesn't matter, even one null is never equal to another, which means that this predicate is gonna to evaluate to an unknown. And the where clause takes what comes from the from before it gets to the where, evaluates each row using logical predicates, and only predicates that evaluate to true will pass and make it to the select. So this query is gonna get no rows are gonna get back to the select, and the same is going to be where breed equals null is also going to not return a single row because any comparison between a null is always an unknown and the where only lets through um, rows where the predicate evaluates to true. But that has even more interesting side effects. So for example, if I want to say uh, I want to look for all animals, let's take uh, Let's take a dog, for example, a Weimar runner. Let's copy this. So let's say I'm looking for all dogs that are Weimar, Weimar runner, right? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm, get, I'm gonna get all dogs that they have the explicit breed of Weimar runner, right? Which makes perfect sense. However, if I want to look for all dogs except for Weimar runners, now something interesting happens because I'm going to get back all the dogs that have a different breed, but I'm not going to get back even a single animal with a null breed. However, a mongrel is not a Weimar runner, right? So logically, you, you would think that in this case, we do want to get back. If I'm looking for all animals who are not Weimar runners, then I would like to see mongrels among them because they're definitely not Weimar runners. Even more confusing is that if I wanna see all animals which are not Weimar runners or all animals which are Weimar runners, this logically should return all animals. An animal is either a Weimar runner or it is not. But still, because of the way that nulls are implemented in SQL, we don't get a single non-breed animal. And that's one, that the reason for that is that Chamberlain and Boyce, for the most part, decided to treat null predicates as if they were 
of the missing but, uh, missing but applicable type. And for a missing but applicable type, this actually makes sense. Because if I look for all persons where their birth date is different than, let me just pick, I don't know. Um, let's find a birth date and copy it here where their birth date is different than October 21st, 1973, because birth date is of the second type, that's an applicable, uh, that's an applicable attribute that we simply don't know. If for this query, not returning people with an all birth date makes sense because they do have a birthday, it may or may not be uh, October uh, 21st, we don't know. But if I'm looking only for people whose birth date is different than that, for the people where we don't know the birth date, I probably don't, I don't want to show them because I don't know whether they do uh, have that birth date or not. But that is not the case for the missing but inapplicable like here, where breed is different than Weimaraner or breed is equal to Weimaraner. And now you can see why COD wanted to implement both. And I think that if Chamberlain and Boyce would have listened to COD and would have implemented both types, and we, and we would have to have, you know, some, some sort of different syntax to be able and some sort of different semantics to be able to distinguish between them, it will actually simplify things and not make them more complex. But that's water under the bridge. So what do people do these days when we want to see um, all, uh, all um, animals which are not Weimar runners? What would you do in order to include those that are also um, non-breed? So the most common thing that I see is or breed is null. So we add an explicit predicate, right? Breed different than Weimar runner or breed is null. And if I execute that, and of course I'm gonna get what logically should have been returned from just this predicate. Now I'm gonna get all the Weimar, all the all the animals except for the Weimar runners. Other people will also do, I see occasionally something like is null breed comma, um, I don't know, some value, doesn't matter what, is different than Weimar runner. And this too would return the correct result, which means we're gonna get back all animals which are either a mongrel Okay. All animals which are not Weimar runner, logically, including those that are non-breed, right? However, this too has devastating performance implications and it doesn't matter, not, not only is this completely unreadable and you will see that when SQL is, the, is at its best when it reads like it's plain English. And when your, when your SQL looks like plain English, your SQL is gonna be clear and efficient and will perform well. Once you start adding this weird logic, regardless if you do it with this or with the or, it's the same. Now, the optimizer has many more execution paths. The, the, we're dealing with uh, multiple predicates with an or between them. Even though SQL Server is relatively smart, other databases are less smart and a query that could have, uh, you know, used an index, for example, on breed, once you do this, no longer can use the index and it's gonna scan the whole table and it's gonna introduce concurrency issues. And again, not to mention that it's simply ugly. However, SQL Server, although SQL Server doesn't support it, 
Um, SQL does offer two ways to deal with it, which are supported by other database engines, such as PostgreSQL, for example. So, of course, I can use the same. Now, this is, um, this is a connection to a PostgreSQL instance. Um, and, of course, I can use the same technique, but there are two additional very interesting techniques that can be used um, to come up with a correct result. Anybody is familiar with them? Does anybody know? Anybody heard of distinct predicate? Okay. So instead of the mathematical different than Weimer runner, the ANSI SQL supports uh, a distinct predicate. And it's spelled as follows Is distinct from Weimer runner. And the idea here is that although nulls are not equal to one another, and since they're not equal, they're also not different, but they are not distinct from one another. So when I say breed is distinct from Weimer runner, that means all breeds which are not Weimer runner, but also all breeds which are null. And that's much more elegant, much prettier, and much more English-like, right? Breed is distinct from Weimar runner. Remember, nulls are not equal to any other value nor to themselves, but they're not distinct from the, they are distinct from other values and not distinct from themselves. The same way, there's also is not distinct from Weimer runner, what do you think this will return? Anybody care to guess? All of them, all, all the uh, Weimer runners. Correct. So this is the same as before. Excellent. But that's not the only one. There's another very, very cool and elegant feature of SQL, which is called a truth test, which we can also use to solve this. And a truth test, unfortunately, also not supported by SQL Server, but is supported by Postgres, is a logical operator that tests the result of a predicate and is spelled is or is not, true, false, or unknown. So what I can say is something like that, where breed equals Weimer runner is not true. And is not true will evaluate to true on both if the predicate inside is either a false or an unknown. Only when it is not true, meaning either false or unknown, will this entire thing evaluate to true. And now I'm getting back all the breeds, including um, the non-breed animals, but of course, without the Weimer runners. And what do you think will happen? How can I do the same using a truth test, but with, but with um, a, a different than operator? It's true. Is True. What did we get back? All non Weimar runner, but no, no nulls. Why? 
because for non-breed animals, this expression evaluates to an unknown. So it's not true. So this whole thing evaluates to a false and the row is not returned. It's not false. Right? So how would you do that? You have to look whether it's either true or unknown. But of course it doesn't make sense. So it's much more clear and easier to understand when you write it like this, where breed equal a Reimer runner is not true. And this is gonna return all non Weinmer runners, including the non null ones. But I think the previous one, the distinct predicate is actually cooler. Um, and this, this is what I call SQL being plain English, oh. right? But unfortunately, if you're with SQL Server, you're gonna have to re resort to either using the is null function or using or predicates. And this all goes back to Chamberlain and Boyce being stubborn and not wanting to implement uh, COD's idea. So anyway, um, we're about halfway through the session. We still have a lot to go. And um, for various reasons, and I'll take some of the blame on myself, um, we're not going to have time for it all. So what I suggest is that since we still have all this, Mark, what do you say we make a part two out of it? Mark? Or do you think it's better was, if we continue? I was, no, I, I was, I had just typed that into the chat when you were, when you were saying it. So yeah, that'd be great. And we'll, we'll schedule a part two and uh, go from there. Yes, and so what we're gonna do in part two is several interesting th things. First of all, we're gonna see, or maybe if, if you wanna stay 10 more minutes, there's one <clears throat> more thing I wanna show you, which is not related directly to that, but one of the questions that I often see, that I often get. So let's take 10 minutes and then uh, we'll leave the group by and everything after that for later. Uh, one of the questions that I often see is um, why, when does it matter if we write the predicates as part of the from, meaning as part of the on clause, or when we, do, when we write the predicates in the where clause. And this also goes back to query processing order. So let's take the following example. Select star from animals as a, inner join uh, adoptions as AD, let's call it AN, adoptions as AD on AN dot uh, species equals AD dot species and AN dot name equals ad dot name. And this is one of the places where Azure Data Studio can still, still is lagging behind a bit. Okay, so this returns all animal adoptions. And let's say that I'm only interested in seeing um, Weimar runner adoptions. Let's see if we have any where um, a n dot breed equals uh, Weimer runner. Did I spell that correctly? Here we have. Let's let's not bet. I didn't. Okay. So let's take this query and let's take another query and copy it. This is one of the 
nicer aspects of Azure Studio. And let's take this so we can put it here. Okay. So let's execute, let's execute. These are both the same. So far, so good. So what would happen if instead of the where clause, I would change it, the filter for Weimar runner to be part of the join. What's gonna happen? Is it gonna make a difference? Same result, right? Same result, we see all five, all of our five Weimar runners were adopted, right? Okay, so as long as we're dealing with an inner join, because the end result is going to be the both only animals who qualified based on the predicate of species and name. And even though here in the query, uh, the left query, this gets evaluated first, including the Weimar runners, only then the set gets moved on to the where clause where each row is gonna be evaluated and only the Weimar runner will remain and get moved to the select. On the right, this is considered part of the part of the on predicate, but still it doesn't matter because only dogs who are spe who the species are the same, whose name are the same, and whose breed is a Weimar runner are gonna get evaluated and moved to the select. However, that thing changes a little bit when we deal with outer joints. So now if I execute the query on the left, we can see that we get um, all five, but I think all five were adopted, yeah. So we still get all the animals that were adopted, but the one on the right, all of the sudden returns far more rows, we get 100 rows, we get all animals back. And why is that? All I did was change the inner joint to a left outer joint. How come this returns? Because the- Five, five rows and this returns a hundred rows. Because the one on the right is a left outer joint. It's gonna join with every record. The one on the left is filtering out those records. Um, I would, you're, you're on the right track, but I would um, um, spell it out a little differently. And again, what we need to do is follow query execution order. So on the left, remember the first thing that got evaluated before it got to the where clause, and I can simply execute just this part of the query, you can see these are all animals including all, um, all the animals that were not adopted, right? So all animals were either adopted or not adopted. The ones who were adopted will have non-null attributes for their adoption uh, attributes. And all those that were not adopted are gonna have nulls. So here we can see for example, for the adoption fee, here we can see all the rows. These are all the animals that were never adopted. As you can see, they have null species, null for everything and the adoption date. This set was moved to the where, and now the where 
went ahead and checked each and every one whether or not the breed is a Weimar runner and in return only the Weimar runners. That is not the case on the left, on the right. On the right, the predicate is now part of the qualification phase before the left outer join. Remember, animals will only be matched when we did the inner join. Animals were only matched if they had the same name in adoptions and in animals, the same species, and if they were Weimar runners. And remember, the outer join takes place after. So now, SQL went back to the animals table and said, okay, all the animals except for these five didn't have a match, so I'm going to reintroduce them back into the set. And that's why we get all the Weimar runners that were adopted, but we also get all the other animals as well, and we get all 100 animals back. So be very, very careful. And by the way, this is one of the reasons, this is the main reason that if the those with the gray hair among you remember that when SQL came out and the second uh, ANSI SQL standard, the uh, ANSI 89, we, um, we used to do joins um, using comma separated value, uh, comma separated tables. So we had something like select star from animals, comma adoptions, and then we would specify the, the joint predicate in the where clause. And the problem was that this introduced so much confusion regarding uh, outer joints, where not only every server had its own original way of denoting outer joint, SQL Server had this uh, star equal. So we had animals dot name star equal uh, adoptions.name. Anybody remember this? But that's not the, not, that in itself is not bad. You know, the fact that it's not readable is one thing. But the fact that we could not separate the predicates that are used for qualifications from the predicates that are used for filtering introduced these kinds of bugs and a lot of hairs were pulled over this thing. So that's the last thing I wanted to show for today because I still see people often confused whether they should put their predicates here or here. So now you understand and you understand why query execution order is responsible for all that. So uh, Mark, I think uh, we can stop at this point and we'll have a part two where we'll continue with group by and having and distinct and how we can work with distinct and group by together, which by the way is available. And I'm also going to show you that having, unlike the common myth that I see often, is not limited to aggregate functions, but we can actually use non-aggregates and having as well, and whether or not it makes sense or not. But let's all do that in the part two of this uh, session. So uh, I'll stop sharing. Mark, you still have some more slides? Yeah, I have no more slides. I'm not going to share again. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Ami, so much for speaking and agreeing to uh, come back for a part two. And we, we should thank Je Jan Janet and Michael and who was that? <laughs> okay. And so I'll work with you on scheduling that. We'll get the word out. I. I put the the link for where we're putting all these the recordings for all the virtual meetings that we're holding uh, in the chat window, and it's available. You can just shoot me an email if you didn't if you decide later you want to see it. And uh, thanks again. We'll we'll see you another time. Stay yeah. safe, and we'll get through these difficult times. <laughs>